discussion now to Singapore, okay? Because the title of our discussion is really that. Is there a moral crisis in Singapore, and and what are these what are these manifestations? Or they, right? Would you like to talk about that? Sure. Uh, Whether we maybe I can have that. Yeah. Well then I'll come back to you as a plenty to unpack that. Um, I want to jump from what I said in the region to Singapore and, and I just want to pull up a few things. Uh, what I think is relevant for Singapore. Uh, first, professionally speaking, you know, uh, looking at research on political science, international relations, you know, in the old days when we talk about democracy, good governance, the key variable we will use, and I think many of us will be familiar with separation of power, or the judiciary, executive, uh, uh, legislature. Rule of law. Yeah, rule of law. Rule of law. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's a different law. Uh, we talk about media freedom. These were the variables we talk about. Right now, the key variable about good governance, democracy, and all of that is the two key words public accountability and anti corruption. So these are the big words that are being mainstream. If you go to any democracy conference, whether it's academic or policy, the opening panel would be on public accountability or anti corruption. Not about rule of law or media freedom anymore because they seen as the most important variable these days to ensure good governance. So this is one sort of intellectual, philosophical, political philosophy development. The second issue is when you go for change, when you go for political contestations, the parties that cross the line are the ones that have a very, very clear reform agenda and they do not backtrack under political pressure, internal lobbying, and so on. So that means if they are quite clear, the political leadership is quite clear that they want to go with the reform, they want to they first of all make sure that within their rank and file, you don't have an anti reformist or anyone who will go against the reform agenda. And also, as you are going campaigning towards a political land, you're going to cross the line, there will be pressures, so-called pressures, to soften your stance away from the reform agenda. The ones who stick to the reform agenda are the ones that cross the line. Uh, move forward party. Pakatan Harapan, just to name a few, right? Then the third variable. So I've mentioned what is the key issue, public accountability slash uh, anti-corruption. And then we go to uh, the reform agenda. If you want to do politically well, you need to have a clear reform agenda. Reform agenda also attracts the young, right? So it's values-based. And the last part is the fact that there's no more winner take all. Coalition must be mainstream and you need to work towards it. Both pre and post election. It's a no brainer. So these are the variables in the region, sir. And I want to just explain how I see this in Singapore. So I'll address the first point. Uh, by the way, I'm also speaking at the SDP event tomorrow, so that's a plug, so you're most welcome. Uh, I still have uh, homework to do. I'm, I'm doing research, actually, about this whole thing, uh, about all, all the shenanigans uh, or scandals. I was disallowed the word scandal here, but now in the retrospect, I think I was quite right. But never mind, you can comment later. I just made it wrong. And then, um, um, and, and, and you know, I, the, the event is tomorrow afternoon, so I will also just be a bookworm tomorrow and finish my research. But I, it's three quarter done, so I can share with you what I'm finding, right? First of all, I think we are discussing uh, whatever that's happening 
in our society in a very, very short term. Very now in history time. My research has shown, and I'll be presenting this tomorrow uh, in a more detailed way, but I can just share with you. We have problems with the People's Actions Party from 1966. Corruption cases. So I've been documenting case by case. I can tell you, each of them who have been Corrupt. I'm not talking about the moral issue, which is a different one. I'm just talking about those dealing with financial. Minimum have spent two, minimum three terms in parliament. So that means these people have been in parliament. These are facts. Yeah, please. How did you get to me in 1966? What is a what is check? Oh, no, no. I mean, I, I, I do proper research. I mean, go to National Archives, uh, newspaper records. And so, so there were there were incidents, there were events in 1966 pointing towards what you were talking about. Yeah, 1966 is one incident. Then you have another uh, incident in 75, and so on and so forth. You almost have regular incidents. You can ask for the incidents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm actually, you know, uh, uh, tabling them out. Because Quite a, quite a few of us here have been listening to them. I believe really, really find the people. Who are these fellows? Well, I, I have to set up and look at my phone, which I can, but, but I just want to give you the big picture. Big picture first. So there has been a constant uh, flow of, let's say, financial uh, uh, misuse of office kind of behavior. There's one slither and it's regular. Okay, that's one. So when we talk about the incident now, we should go back historically and pull out the facts. Then you have a slither of uh, this ethics, moral, you know, personal behavior issues, right? I don't want to judge, I think many of us don't want to judge, you know, because these are personal choices and affect individuals, behavior, you know, all of that. But I think we can call out in those incidents procedural matters. You know, uh, there was conflict of interest, why was it, uh, you know, managed this way, uh, and, and, and all of that. Then, there is another category. And this is where the write out issues fit in. There's a list of uh, people who have been found not uh, liable in any way. So the state has made some inquiry, made some investigation, appointed some committee, and so on, and then found out there was no wrongdoing. So there is also that issue. What do we see? In the early days, when somebody, when something like this happened, it always involved an SMC. Most of the time, there was a by-election. With the GR, and that, that is some level of accountability. But with the GRC system, and with the Prime Minister through the court case having the right to decide when to call an election for a GRC, there's no accountability. So you have more accountability in the SMC, fully SMC system, but in the GRC, that accountability has disappeared. So this is a very important thing. The other thing, and I invite you to look at the CPIB website. Some of these details of those days, I, I went to the CPIB website. They're very proud. We say they did this case, la, 1996, failed you know, all of that, 97, 1975. If there is so many incidents, I mean, over a period of 40 years, regularly every five, 10 years, you have this incident. What kind of advice has the CPIB given to this political party? If it's 
40, 50 years of shenanigans. I mean, as a bureaucracy, right, you must set the golden standard. So it seems, because the PAP has been left unchecked, because in the early days there was no multi-party system, and now we have a one-party dominated system, there's no accountability. So you will see that for every incident, the action taken is not consistent. Meaning, no, nobody has been sent. They all resign. What my eye? One incident, <laughs> right? But previously, they just resigned. Sometimes there was no uh, no by election. They just wait six months later. They call for general election. So there is. So if you want to understand this issue, and I come back to the three points that I raised about public accountability, uh, anti-corruption, which is here, the evidence is clear as crystal. You put from 1966 to 23, you will see all the gaps very jarring, and this is all from public record. And then you have CPIB putting up some of this incident with no analysis, right? The analysis is so straightforward, right? Now, uh, here's the fun fact. In a single uh, uh, SMC, right? In a couple of occasions, when the person has been uh, uh, resigned, found guilty, the next election, that constituency no more. Sounds familiar, right? Yeah. So which means there is multi-level of accountability to be needed. James. Yes. Professor Jonathan Kwa is an authority on corruption in Singapore. Do you make reference to this work? No, absolutely not. Why? Because when I was an undergraduate, for my questioning of the uh, Asian, uh, national values, I was given a third class honors by Jonathan. <laughs> yeah. John Kwa. My American professor gave me a first class. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I read your book on politics. Yeah, huh? before that. And then my thesis was the only one has to go to Australia for adjudication. Because first class, fairly good student, first class, critic of national values, third class, had to go to Australia. Australia, you know, middleman gave me second class. Yeah, no. <laughs> Completely different, huh? Ah. So, excuse me, if I cite his work only to criticize it. <laughs> yeah, and that was... From Bala, was it? No, I was doing philosophy. I, was, uh, I should have taken philosophy on it, not, not the political science on uh, my fault. <laughs> Probably, well, at least they will give me a 2-1. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you would have done one. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so coming back to the analysis, so SMC more accountable, GRC more accountable, it's a regular occurrence of five, ten years in the mission, you have one of these things. You have those called moral, ethical issues of a personal relationship. Uh, we don't question that so much, but, but look at the process of how those were managed. Yeah. There is no consistent uh, pattern of behavior. So you have a party, 40, 50 years, 60 years in power, where its level of process, for those of us who have done business, right, three to five, wow, our protocol SOP is so good. What? 60 years in power, party SOP, you don't have it. And then why would you, as a political party, in power for 60 years? Go and follow civil service guidelines. Why would you do that? And we are equally responsible because we don't question, right? They have committed the sin of omission. They don't tell the truth. So they omit. It's the sin of omission. That's a mortal sin. 
that. Yeah, that is called the sin of omission because I believe God was referred to in the recent <laughs> parliamentary, right? The sin of omission is the mortal sin you go to have. Right? When is reflecting. Sorry to be biblical today. <laughs> so, I, 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 will, I will just pause here for now and, and yeah, happy to interact. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I go to that remark you made earlier that the future of politics in this part of the world uh, will have to be a coalition politics. Uh, but in Singapore, you don't see any real coalition politics. And I don't even see the PAP engaging in a coalition politics with any of the other parties. And they've never done that. But if you say that, you know, this is the route to go and this is where the future is, how do you envisage coalition politics here? And why would it come about? I mean, we have to look at the results. So here I will, it, it's values-based. Coalition needs to be values-based. Who would have thought that the BN would be wiped so long in Malaysia, Barisan National? Barisan National is only in name, it's only unknown. MIC, MCA, zero. So they shouldn't even be called Barisan National. It should be just called UMNO. But the progressives did not have the vote, the numbers, the uh, PA, and PKR, the more dominant and progressive lot, also couldn't uh, get together, but it was not overall dominant. So in, in an ideal world, you should have a coalition with uh, those who, who share the same values. But what we are seeing is the polit politics of expediency, right? And what happens both in Thailand and in Malaysia, and I started with Malaysia first, we spoke a lot about Thailand. You see, we, we know that the biggest problem in Malaysia now is the three parts race, religion, and royalty. You see, Malaysia, you know, we talk about harmony. You know, in diverse society, we always build harmony. But Malaysia cannot build the harmony. Why? Because its harmony measures are always divided. Jakin, Islam and all that component. If you are a minor Islamic uh, sect, which is not endorsed by the mainstream, that's even worse. Then you have under the Ministry of Unity, not Islam groups. So multi-faith groups, right, cannot bring Islamic groups into a coalition. So this is the dilemma, right? So the PKR, right, Anwar, in order to differentiate himself from BN, which was, you know, the three R's, introduced diverse uh, multiculturalism and social justice. Because he wanted to appeal to the Malay World Bank, but also to the other communities. So he needed a device. Is see against the three arms? No. Because it'd be political suicide. So it is, he practiced three arms with a tone of soft multiculturalism and justice to all communities, social fairness, equity. 
right? So Malaysian politics is stuck like that. So the assumption going into the election was, okay, PKR is reformist, the Chinese voters threw their back, the Indian voters 50-50, because extreme minorities, they are always not stable, right? But he cannot carry the, uh, the multicultural uh, agenda through because he don't have the numbers. So he has to partner with uh, Amlo, yeah. And because of that, he had to compromise. So he began publicly to say, my government will not sell, uh, support LGBTI groups, for example. Islam will be the religion of the country. Malays will continue to get more support because he's for fighting for votes in Kelantan and Tragadu. So that's it. Okay, it's a very racialized uh, society, so it requires a racial religiousness. Let's move away from that. Let's move to Thailand. No, sorry, Dave. Before you go on to Thailand, right, the three R's religion. But the Qatar National actually campaigns on pro-Islamic values. So do you see a danger that they are pushing towards a more extremist Islamic kind of uh, agenda? Okay, I think we need to put that. In. So so what Alfred asked is uh, the Parikata National, is it going through a more sort of extremist, uh, racist agenda? Uh, my reading across the region right, is like this. The internet has reduced everybody's monopoly on information and everybody's monopoly on agenda setting. So there is a big disruption. The ruling elites can feel it. They can feel their power slipping away. They do not have total control, but they are trying to hold on. So at this period of change. The hardcore lawyers, the loyalties uh, of these regimes, they engage in extreme measures. You can call them radical, you can call them extra, uh, extremists. In some countries where race and religion is not so much a marker, let's say in Thailand or in Cambodia, they will be ultra-nationalists but all of an extreme form because they need to go right way in order to rally their support for the elites who are slowly losing their power. It's the last J chapter. So it's coming back to Malaysia, yes, the Malay vote back is 60% and uh, they are trying to campaign, but the Malay vote is very, very varied. It is not homogeneous. Many Malays, you know, like or, uh, people of Muslim faith, are very different. When I go to Malaysia, you know, I'm told by Muslim women, James, don't talk about freedom to believe or freedom not to believe. I am forced to believe. That's what I, I, I uh, last week I was in, uh, presenting something on three R's at the uh, Malaysian Bar Council. Yeah. Women. It's my right not to wear a tudong. I don't need an imam to tell me. Right? So, so the Malaysian context is very, very varied within that. Right? And, um, for example, one NGO, Sisters in Islam, right? They want rights for Muslim women to not to wear the hijab, among other things. You know, and they say, look, the other problem with uh, or challenge in Malaysia is they want the mainstream Sharia law over civil law, right? So Sharia law is supreme. So, so there are other challenges there for you know other communities and, 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 and things like that. So coming back, you will see right wing extremism, 
radicalization, uh, ultra-nationalists will be the features of campaigns and hate as societies go through a regime change. It's, it's a natural manifestation. And we, you know, coming back to Singapore, that's why you have all these hate signs, you know, spouting negativity. You know, right now we, we, we can already recognize all the fake accounts, right? No persona and things like that. So, this is very important. So, Singapore is also, for me, in a crossroad. The ruling party is properly exposed. And if, if I bring in that whole historical list of uh, issues, they resign strategically before election. There's no accountability, there's no process. Uh, CPIB you know, celebrates their achievements of investigation, but they have no analysis. They have not told us whether they have advised this institution to introduce more compliance, even if we, if we take a positive approach, I mean, you know, we are involved in so many things that uh, deal with, you know, money matters. Every year, you know, you go to an accountant or you go to an auditor or, or, or a partner and so on, they will tell you, okay, these are the gaps. Let's strengthen it. Let's put more processes in place so we have uh, more diligence, more better reporting and all that. 60 years, and CPIB cannot advise a major institution that has had so many people over the years. Something is not right. Something is not right. Right? So until we look at it from a longitudinal point of view, we might be uh, myopic in just looking at this incident. Right? Because the GRC system also doesn't give you a company. Right? So, so you have now what? Five GRCs empty? I'm talking about two parties, right? That are in parliament with elected seats. Five GRC empty. That is 700,000 voters affected. You add West Coast, another 150. That's 850,000. So that is nearly 40% of the electorate. The electorate was only about 2.2, I think. Right? Yes. Yeah.
exigencies of, uh, like you say, ANWA has to give some allowances uh, to Malays and so on and so forth. He himself is uh, personally appealing to say, please trust me, sort of, with, uh, so that I can, I can uh, consolidate and so on and so forth. Uh, and, 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 uh, that was, I think, your point. So I think uh, it goes without saying that everybody was, uh, at the end of the day, I'm just reminded that uh, what Mao Zedong said, that power comes from the barrel of the gun. In other words, of course, we, don't, we are not talking about guns, whether it's in Thailand or Singapore, but unless you have the political power uh, to change the government, a lot of these things will just continue. I mean, so, I mean, we are here 40 years, 50 years, talking about kind of things. Uh, this is, is, is quite frustrating, you know? Uh, uh, just a small story, okay? When, uh, during, during my, uh, uh, before my time in school, uh, we had uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, science labs. Catholic High did not have enough science lab. Okay, LKY called up the teacher in charge of the our school and said, uh, "Can you help Catholic High with uh, some of the uh, giving them some time on the video science lab? After all, you had more than that." So the guy said, "Okay, let me see how far I can step in." He came up with the idea. He said, "Okay, since we have the science lab in our school." We will uh, use the science lab, but only in the morning. That's yeah. why I would only use it in the afternoon. That very afternoon, that can, uh, can can you come to the point? What's the point? Okay, that very afternoon, that very afternoon, the teacher was fired for making that decision, and this was before 19, 19 something, uh, seventy something. So ba basically, point, let me summarize what you are trying to say. My point, you're, my you're basically saying that uh, the political system run by the incumbent government, right, uh, is actually practicing double standards, right? When it, uh, when it comes to their own interests, they are very vigilant. When it comes to other people's interests, they uh, put it aside. Right. So, so that is the that is the. A uh, kind of cultural problem yeah, in, in the political system, right? Would you want to comment about that? Uh, I mean, everybody, every, everybody knows that. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so what is the, what's the, what's the question? And, and the conclusion you have come to is that you got to get rid of the government, right? And have a new <laughs> government, right? Okay. So, so, so that that that's the conclusion, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> correct. Yes. <laughs> this is just a bit. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think I have a lot of support. This. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, any other? Any other? Okay. Yeah, I'll just ask a brief question, a quick one. Uh, okay, basically, there's a, as all of us know, there's a recent spate of vaccination of MPs in Parliament, right, over uh, so called affairs, our personal affairs. So, my question is this. Um, um, okay, what right does a party or maybe this leader have to order the vaccination of the MPs, right? Uh, yeah, uh, based on what? Is it based on PAP's code of conduct or is it based on the uh, uh, code of conduct for MPs? Because uh, as far as I can discern, it does not objectively impact or impair the uh, MP to carry out his duties. So I, I felt that unless there is a strict objectified code of conduct, otherwise uh, we might be following PAP's game plan or maybe a certain party's game plan or dominant or incumbent game plan for so many years just because they've been power for so long. So are we following their guideline or are we following a certain objectified standard rule or guidelines for MPs, which I believe in this case does not impair or impact their duties or the carry out their duties. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure whether whether your uh, what you are doing 
do you conduct polls with regards to you know the recent happenings uh, just to get a feeling from the ground? That's my first question. Now the second question is that uh, over the years, uh, AJ's AGC has reported many many lapses, right? But it seems that nothing has been done to take care of the culprits. So perhaps your comments? Uh, I'll circle back to my comment. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, no, we didn't do any. Uh, I didn't do any polls. Uh, polls take time and money, and uh, so one of the things I want to just just throw it out uh, to colleagues here is we do need an independent kind of research institute in Singapore that looks at some of these, as you said, lapses, public policy issues that should be kind of citizen funded, privately funded, so that you know you do not get eaten by the state. Right, so it's very important. It, it doesn't have to be big. It can have a, a, a competent core, small group of people, then the rest can be on a piecemeal uh, basis, volunteer. That's done by IBS. No, uh, so like I said, independent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. yeah. So so I think we need that to, to adhere to all of this, especially uh, issues like this time. And because we don't have that kind of uh, Right. Uh, I believe political parties and you know and all those that I have come come across with, I always felt that you should have an in-house research ability. You must have. You must develop. It's very important. If you if you say media is important, research and policy development is equally important as media because without content, there's no media. Right? Because until you have that intellectual capacity, rigor, and analysis, right, you cannot push up your content. You can have the uh, yeah. So, so I think those two are interrelated, and I think people cannot respond to the AGC stuff because political parties, you know, even if you have MPs or NCMPs, right, you need that research support. And NCFPs are highly disadvantaged because they, they get next to nothing, you know, uh, to support their work. So that's an issue. So I come back to my questions about whose role are we playing. I, I think we, we are not uh, playing it by any rules. I mean, if you look at the reserves, the operation of the GICs and, you know, Tamase holding and all that, in the old days, under the new, right? Very opaque, but only in the recent years, slowly there was some kind of reporting, so not satisfactory at all, right? But so the system is still, in that sense, in terms of transparency, is still third world. This this is it, right? So when it comes to holding the ruling party, you know, it's impossible when the judges tell you, I'm sorry, we cannot interpret the law because the law has been interpreted, passed by parliament. We can only give you the verdict and how much sentencing based on other previous case laws, right? And some technical issue. And then if you want to appeal, you have to go to the minister because the minister has the final say, not the courts. So we are caught up in the system and coming back. So I'd say the first point, anti corruption, public accountability, I think we've exhausted that. The second point, reform. So any political party that wants to take traction must have a clear reform agenda. Then you can grab uh, traction. If you are same, same like the BAP, you cannot stand up for the ground. Cannot. So that's the defining. So uh, and then the third point, right? Coalition. Because no party is going to win, right? The ruling party, of course, will try to uh, put forward. But my sense, you know, cyclical sense, I think they will suffer a three to four percent vote swing for sure, four or five. 
then uh, the date in some uh, constituency will be more, you know, and that's where, you know, I mean, uh, the key thing, you know, is at this stage is to cut off the two-third majority, yeah. So this is a natural progress, even in Malaysia, you cut off the two-third majority and then you build the momentum for change. Okay, um, James, so I'll, two questions. First question is on reform. Now, as far as I know, STP has a lot of sound policies uh, that they've been pushing out through all the years and they've been talking about reform also for a long, long time. But if you really notice, a lot of the uh, policies or suggestions that SDP came out with has been incorporated into the TP, although they would never admit that. So I, I'm, trying, I'm struggling to understand why does Jane Potterchi and the SDP keep pushing out this knowing that their suggestions will be incorporated and plagiarized uh, and eventually what are they trying to achieve because um, when, it, when Dr. Chi was younger, he was very fiery and really wanted to reform and the leftists and you know, support of the other class. But now they seem to have mellowed out a lot. And I think there's a problem here for political parties because they are so constricted by the regulations and uh, the restrictions that the PAP put in place for electoral process that they're basically tied one hand behind their back. So moving to your third point of coalition and possibility of change in government, uh, do you see the only way that uh, we have a coalition is an opposition coalition? Yeah. Um, why? My understanding of why the SDP uh, did, uh, not just the SDP and later on other parties, it was one of the first, uh, is actually uh, to rebut the idea that or the opposition movement has no ideas. So that's why there was an aggressive push. And you know, um, there were all kinds of people, uh, non political party people who came uh, who, I mean, the health policy was literally written by doctors. And the old days, Paul was just uh, one of the uh, members of that committee. So we had so many doctors who did that. So, so specialist people came. Uh, behind those papers and that's why uh, that. The other thing that all political parties collectively did was to create, the, uh, to push out the myth that opposition parties only come out during the election. That has also been fully dis uh, dispelled because that argument cannot be used. So, so you see increasingly these arguments by the uh, uh, PAP about the opposition, right? Uh, the naysaying and negative framing has been mostly rebutted, right? It is being re uh, repeated by, for example, uh, the trolls, for example. Uh, but, you know, uh, when you troll for so long, 10, 15 years, people are new also, right? And then the second thing is, um, we know the mainstream media is like that, right? Uh, even if the young reporters just report properly, you know, the editors will change the headline and, you know, all of that. So, uh, I mean, the fact that they have to put trust uh, says everything. Uh, the lack of trust and all the shenanigans of, you know, uh, building up the numbers or building the numbers, yeah, it doesn't work. So I think there is enough awareness in the body politic uh, that I think we cannot take the crap anymore. Yeah, it's it's like don't even try to pull wool over our eyes, you know. You know. So we have switched off. Now it's all about action. Now but the one thing I want to bring to the to the fore, right? We have to look around and see that unlike Malaysia, uh, Singapore is also a place with 4. 4, what, 40, 45% of the residents in Singapore are not voters. 
and we live among their midst. So when they are not voters, right, there is also that kind of impact. Because every family has authority in their midst. So we often don't talk about the dynamics of how that works. Right? Many people take up citizenship simply for functional reasons. Right? And not for any sort of, you know, uh, uh, sort of political or, let's say not even political, let's say values based principle. If you go to Thailand, right, and uh, uh, Singapore, the people who come to Singapore, they have a particular value. They come here because it's a place to work, generate income, very materialistic, you know, it's efficient, clean, and so on. They need high wages. Ideally, depending on the district. Right? You go to Thailand, the motivation is different. The foreigners who come, uh, in a minute, yeah, the foreigners who come, they want to work for NGOs. They don't mind getting a thousand dollars, US dollars, thirty thousand baht to be an English language teacher. You know, uh, they can live simply, they can eat street food. So the type of people who come to Thailand, and I, I talk about people from all over the globe, come for different reasons, right? And uh, you, you, you know, I also want to explain why I decided to register Asia Center in Bangkok. So we have a joke among uh, international organizations. The ideal regional hub in Southeast Asia should be in Jakarta because the ASEAN Secretary is there, a lot of some of the regional institutions are there, but nobody wants to go. Traffic is still horrible, the bureaucratic red tape is extremely high, it's also a very expensive city. Singapore wants to be the hub, but nobody will come to Singapore unless Singapore pays the airfare <laughs> and uh, accommodation. Thailand pays nothing, but everybody wants to go to Bangkok. So I decided to open the Asia Center there because everybody from the world is going to come. And I, every week I have visitors, international visitors. Yeah, I hold my annual conferences in Bangkok because everybody wants to come to Bangkok for a conference and stay another two days to go to the night market. You know, yeah, I can't do that uh, in Singapore. I mean, not to mention, you know, the culture of engaging in this kind of intellectual work. You organize a talk like this, whole house. You have Myanmarese over there, you know, there's no special rules and, 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 and things like that. So, coming back to that. Yeah, that was a question.